Hello, I am Amanda Schmidt, Program and Communications Officer for the Sufon Center, and it is my pleasure to present TSE's briefing today focused on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and implications for the global security architecture and prevention of extremism and terrorism. On February 24th, Russia's President Vladimir Putin announced a special military operation against Ukraine, commencing Russia's invasion. Putin's unprovoked aggression towards Ukraine has been roundly declared a violation of international law and a direct challenge to the post-war rules-based international order. As a permanent member of the UN Security Council, Russia's flagrant violation of the UN Charter has been widely denounced. Thus far, the war has already taken over 900 civilian lives, and Russia has bombarded cities and civilian areas indiscriminately, prompting an unprecedented flow of refugees in Europe and beyond. Already, the Czech Republic, for example, has declared they have reached maximum absorption capacity, and it remains to be seen how European states respond as the conflict draws on. Over 3 million Ukrainian refugees fled the country in the first three weeks of the conflict alone. Although the reception has been welcoming thus far, the astounding rate of displacement into Europe from this conflict forebodes a large population vulnerable to radicalization should individuals increasingly face hardship in access to resources or isolation and discrimination. Alternatively, depending on the evolution of conflict dynamics and conduct, this risk is particularly pronounced if foreign fighters aiming to eventually return to their home countries face similar political indecision as that seen by foreign terrorist fighters and their families remaining in displacement camps or detention centers in northeast Syria and Iraq. In response to Russia's invasion, NATO countries and allies have implemented an array of sanctions on Russia, targeting elites, top banks and state-owned enterprises, energy, and technology exports to Russia. While Putin seems impervious to the impact on his people, the long-term impacts on Russia are likely to diminish its ability to present itself as a serious player in great, com power, com great power competition. One dynamic of the conflict that is partic of particular concern is the increasing flow of foreign fighters or volunteers to the battlefield on both sides. Whether the individuals are those inspired to aid Ukraine for largely humanitarian and pro-democracy motives, or supporters of Russia from the Middle East, private military contractors supporting the Russian military, or others, the expanded involvement of foreign fighters in Ukraine could potentially increase the duration and lethality of the conflict, as well as skew the objectives and narratives. Areas of concern for the involvement of foreign fighters include implications for the conduct of war, particularly for individuals untrained in the laws of war and IHL, and unclear alignments on the battlefield and co-opting of foreign fighters by armed groups. Additional concerns include uncertainty about the return of foreign fighters to their home countries, as well as perception by Russia of foreign fighters' involvement as an extension of Western government's foreign policy. The adoption of counterterrorism legislation, particularly after 2014, could also complicate the legal framework in some countries. The issue is only further complicated by the presence of violent far-right extremists in the fray, though their numbers remain very low at this stage. Therein, Russia has enabled and supported white supremacy and neo-Nazi extremists internationally for years in an effort to destabilize Western countries. In the earlier conflict in eastern Ukraine, the Sufan Center found that 17,000 foreign fighters, over 15,000 of whom were Russian nationals, traveled to fight on both sides between 2014 and 2019, some motivated by far-right and white supremacy ideologies. President Putin's current denazification rhetoric against the democratically elected government of Ukraine, under the leadership of President Vladimir Zelensky, who is Jewish, is entirely baseless. Such disinformation narratives and conspiracy theories pertaining to the war in Ukraine, espoused by Kremlin-aligned actors, also serve to reinforce already existing extremist narratives on the far right. These include disinformation narratives on the presence of U.S.-run biolabs in Ukraine, that Putin is liberating victims of human trafficking in Ukraine, and that the CIA is training ISIS members to be deployed to the conflict. These false narratives seek to further enforce already existing ideologies, 
that have historically motivated political violence, including QAnon, COVID-19 conspiracies, and anti-government sentiments. Such dynamics of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine have implications for the global extremism and terrorism landscape. While foreign fighters have been few in numbers thus far, the longer that Russia prolongs the invasion, it could attract extremists who could more broadly shift conduct and objectives in the battlefield. The conflict offers white supremacy extremists the same training opportunities that instability in the Balkans, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria have offered jihadist militants for years. In an active war zone, groups and individuals motivated by far-right ideologies will develop operational and tactical experience that would otherwise be unavailable to them in their home countries, as well as foster personal networks with like-minded communities. With new skill sets and expanded networks, these fighters present a twofold risk to civilians in Ukraine, as well as the violence they can wreak upon their return home. The normative impact on democratic governance and international diplomacy, if Russia were to deem its actions successful, would be disastrous and would likely inspire further violent action by other state and non-state actors. Particularly, it could embolden countries like China and Iran to increase their own quests for influence in Asia and the Middle East. It also risks a longer-term paralysis of the Security Council, where there are a number of issues that require some modicum of cooperation among permanent members, including peacekeeping missions and other agenda items relating to peace and security. To counter the risks to international peace and security by both state and non-state actors, Nordic leaders should consider the following, particularly with regard to foreign fighters. Over the past weeks, our team has identified a number of recommendations to address various aspects of the challenge. One, publish clear guidelines regarding ways that volunteers can sign up for officially established organizations if interested in supporting Ukraine. Two, offer basic public information about international humanitarian law and the laws of armed conflict. Three, potentially organize a registry for those traveling to Ukraine to track involvement and offer guidance for returning or circumstances in which prosecution may be pursued. Four, evaluate state counterterrorism legislation as well as any legislation enacted to comply with UN Security Council resolutions 2178 and 2396 following the rise of ISIS to prevent the recruitment and travel of foreign terrorist fighters in order to see if and how this may affect volunteers in Ukraine. Five, consider designation of Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Six, consider domestic designations of violent far-right groups to curb their abilities to exacerbate conflicts. And seven, counter state-backed disinformation campaigns about the war in Ukraine that seek to galvanize the far-right and stoke anti-democratic and anti-government sentiments. Transparency and early debunking of Russian disinformation narratives on Ukraine has proven an effective tactic. Thank you for your time.